Welcome again to everyone who has joined us today for our webinar um, being presented by the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center, The Future of Business is Accessible. Young business leaders talk full inclusion. I'm very happy that we have with us a panel of um, people who are going to talk a little bit about where they think uh, things are with business and inclusion, and then what their vision is of the future. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce today's panelists, or actually they're going to go ahead and introduce themselves. So we're gonna go ahead and start with, I believe it's uh, Emmeline. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Absolutely. Hi everyone, my name is Emmeline LaCrout. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and visual description, I'm a white woman with shoulder length, brown, straight hair, and I'm wearing, um, I'm pretty sure it's a pink button down. Um, I'm also blind. Um, I currently um, am working for Unilever as an associate sales manager on our condiments business. Um, so I've been in the world of business for um, a couple of years now. Um, and I also do a lot of disability advocacy work, both within Unilever and outside of the company um, on different projects. Um, and uh, my, my new third career is I'm a competitive rock climber as well. Um, so it's a great stress relief and a lot of fun. Awesome. So if everybody can see the PowerPoint, if you want to go ahead and uh, go in order of the names there and introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about yourself. I think we have Alexis next. Hi, my name is Alexis. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I go by Alexis. My physical description, I'm wearing a gold cardigan with a black shirt outlined in flowers and I have dread, short dreads and I wear glasses. And what was the other question again? I'm sorry, Ms. Crane. Well, sure. Tell us about uh, what you're doing right now. Are you uh, you're working? Are you in school? Oh. So currently I am working. I work with Enterprise Holdings. It's It was formerly known as Enterprise Rent-A-Car. I am a management trainee there. And I am preparing to go ahead and take my next step and become a, an assistant manager pretty soon. I'm also working off like freelancing with another project manager to create a training course um, for that field. And I do a lot of diversity and equity speaking outside of my day-to-day -day tasks. I'm actually really big on advocating for everyone else um, that has a disabilities because we know sometimes we're always pushed into the shadows of diversity for companies. So I'm always really ready to go ahead and fight for that. Great. Um, Lakshmi. Hi, everyone. My name is Lakshmi Shamakrishnan. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. I am an Indian woman with achondroplasia, which is the most common form of short-limb dwarfism. I'm wearing a striped blouse. I have mid-length black hair, and my background is blurred. Um, I'm an alumnus of the University of Maryland, go Terps, <laughs> and I graduated with my bachelor's and my master's from there. And currently I work at Appian Corporation as a recruiting coordinator. Um, and I got involved in disability inclusion while pursuing my business degrees. And it began with recognizing that there was a lack of accessibility in the spaces around me. Um, so I started something called the Restroom Accessibility Initiative, where I realized that there were some soap dispensers at my business school's restrooms that were placed on the other side of the counter. So people who have physical disabilities that affect their height and their reach are unable to access these. And so I worked with the building services team to add additional reachable soap dispensers um, to these restrooms. And that kind of kickstarted a lot of my disability advocacy work. And I've realized that I could make a difference and that I could use my disability as a platform um, to speak up for people who might not be able to and people who are gonna come after me in these environments. Um, so following this initiative, I got the chance to give a TEDx talk give accessibility presentations to different companies. Um, and I definitely hope to continue this kind of advocacy work in the future because this is an underrepresented demographic in the business world. Um, and there is a lack of education about how to hire and accommodate people with disabilities in the workplace. So really excited to be here on this panel today. Thank you again for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to learning from all the amazing panelists here as well. Thank you. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, 
Emma and Anna Marie, if you want to introduce yourselves, and then I am going to circle back around and Lakshmi, thank you so much for, you know, giving me information about how you got involved. And I, I want to hear from everybody about how you got involved with um, efforts around disability business and inclusion. So Emma, go ahead. Thank you, Carleen. Um, my name is Emma Karch. I go by she, her, and hers pronouns. I am a white woman with shoulder length, brown hair. Um, I'm wearing a brown blazer. I'm currently sitting at my desk in my home. Um, and I am very excited to be here. I am currently studying management at the University of Maryland. And while I'm working, I'm, while I'm studying, I'm also working part-time as an intern at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Great. And then Anna Marie. All right. Hello. I'm um, Anna Zetzel. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And um, for the visual um, description, I'm a, a white woman with straight, um, yay, shoulder length, um, like brown hair. Um, and I'm, I have a lot of freckles and I'm wearing a, a brown turtleneck. Um, Currently, I am in the last year of my master's degree. I study applied data science, and then I also work on part-time as a laboratory technician. And um, yeah. That's great. So um, Anna, I'll just kind of work my way backwards here. Uh, tell me a little bit how you got involved in business and disability inclusion and you know why that's important to you. Yeah, so, I mean, disability had always been um, kind of an important topic to me, because, I mean, like, for one, I, I'm an autistic woman, and um, my little sibling has spina bifida, and so we've been involved in the community for a long time, but um, on the business end of things, that, I guess, all started in, um, I guess, university, where I was starting to think about my um my own career and what options I had to find like a, a healthy workplace and to get the accommodations I need. Um, what really got me, I guess, um, going was that in the year um, 2020, I was a um, next gen leader with um, disability in which um, I think some of the people in the panel were also um, next gen leaders, but um, the program uh, taught me a lot about um, what I desire in a career in a workplace. And um, I guess that that is where I first, I guess, became interested in the topic and started looking into what I could do. Great. Emma, how about you? Sure, thank you. Um, so the moment that I kind of got involved with disability and inclusion is when I was working as an intern at an elementary school with um, a kindergarten class. Um, there was a kid named Gabe in the class who was autistic and seeing the way that the teacher just was able to manage the 25 kids, um, even in the fit of his outbursts, just gave me a lot of hope. They were taught to say no thank you whenever he said anything that was insulting or um, threatening to them. And it it really inspired me and to that to see that the kids were able to look past the differences and just be flexible. Um, and so I, unlike Gabe, was not able to function in a typical classroom. I, um, I have anxiety and it was very difficult for me in school. So I had to find somewhere that worked for me, but I've advocated for my needs for a while now. And I hope to have, be an advocate for others um, through working in HR in the future. Sounds great. Um, Alexis, go ahead. Um, so I officially really started advocating more and becoming really inside disability and diversity as a next gen leader at our last Las Vegas conference with disability in um, by being there. I gained a lot of confidence by seeing other people that had like disabilities, even if it was physical or just like intellectual. Um, everyone had like this nice confidence level and, and disability and made sure that they built that. So when I finally returned back to school afterwards, I was more confident. And then I really started seeing more, more of a need of actually advocating for people that were similar to me, especially since I'm autistic and, and I have ADHD and my mom is hard of hearing. Um, so it just opened up my eyes trying to see more into the world and not trying to always be like a cookie cutter. 
and seeing everything was okay. I apologize, something happened to my screen. Uh, um, um, I just took down the PowerPoint, <laughs> so, oh, <okay. laughs> so you're fine. Um, right. um, and then um, we'll go back up to the top of our list here with Emma Line. Yeah. So I, when I when I was growing up, I've always been legally blind, um, and I was always a little bit sad because I didn't know anybody else uh, who had a disability who was my age, uh, much less who was also blind um, and and was a young person. Uh, so when I got to college, I really quickly, I wanted to meet other people like me. Um, so I found a disability advocacy organization on my campus. Um, and like quickly, that just meant so much to me. All of a sudden I realized, um, no, I wasn't some kind of like failure as a human because I couldn't see and all the weird things I did because I was blind, like those weren't bad. Those were just how I was. Um, and so slowly that kind of built and within that disability advocacy organization, um, I saw a friend of mine, she just asked a professor to add an automatic door opener button uh, to a building and he like made that happen. And I thought, wait, like you can, you can do things. <laughs> um, so I did something similar. There was a set of uh, stairs on my campus and, and you work with a guide dog and I had a dog at the time, you're trained to use handrails on stairs, but there were no handrails on these stairs and it just always bothered me so much. Um, so I went up to a professor um, who was one of the deans at the time. And I asked him, hey, like, do you think we could get handrails? And he said, that's a good idea. Uh, six months later, like handrails magically appeared on the staircase. Um, and that was like so inspiring to me, the idea that, oh my gosh, like you can see something and you can fix it. Um, and so ever since then, um, I've done uh, legislative advocacy, lobbying for disability legislation. Um, I do um, awareness events, also internal disability events, putting together conferences for blind youth. Um, and then when I entered the workforce, this kind of accelerated. I've always had, my, my major was in marketing, but also on the side, I spent all these hours working on disability projects. So when I started at Unilever, it's just a big company that touches a lot of consumers. Um, I thought maybe there's something I can do here. Um, and so my first big project was, um, I was just an intern and I said, hey, can we start putting alt text on our social media? Um, and kind of one thing led to another, one person after another was said, hey, that's a good idea. You should talk to this person, that person. Um, and a year later, we had hit 95% compliance on our beauty brands, having alt text on their social media and websites. Um, and so I just, I love the work. I think there's so much value in thinking about disability inclusion in business, whether it's a numbers game, whether it's an innovation game, whether it's diversity, there are so many reasons to bring it in. And so I, I keep doing today, like I write, I do legislative work internally, I'm, I'm consulting brands. Um, I do a bit of everything, um, but I just, I love the work and I think it's so, so meaningful. That's fantastic. So, um, and I really, really like hearing, you know, everybody, it sounds like you're very active in these efforts and, and yay, that's, that's what I love to see as somebody who's not of the ADA generation. <laughs> so, um, so my next question, and, you know, anybody can take this. So what are the issues that are really the most important to you personally um, with regard to the inclusion of people with disabilities in business? Um, what is kind of your soapbox issue, I guess? And um, anybody can either start talking or if you want to just raise your hand, that's fine too. I would okay, like to Lakshmi, go. Oh, oh, did we, do we have somebody talking? Yeah. It's okay. Alexis can go. It's totally fine. I'll go. Um, I think for me, like one of the biggest issues in my field, which is customer service, is actually being able to adapt to others and then also having the managers or the leaders um, the leaders behind me actually advocating and helping me out I think that's something that's really big that a lot of people always miss because they're like well if you're autistic you're very high functioning with it and so just because it's a level you also have a standard that all that they want to meet and it seems like it's even harder to break that glass the, the metaphorical glass ceiling mm -hmm. and it's it's very annoying. And sometimes you, you also see another issue is like being able to be promoted inside your field. If you're not like a certain standard or, or it is easier for you to be fired because you're not at that standard. So a lot of people do leave. And that's why a lot of people, um, I do believe the disabled workforce is the highest untapped workforce 
And the only reason why a lot of people were able to get jobs was because of COVID, because then no one can actually see how you look because we have a camera and those filters, thank God for them at that point. And you're able to uh, um, really access more, more things. So the pandemic, that's one of the greatest things of the pandemic that kind of is trying to fix that issue, but you still don't have it on that personal level of leaders actually just being able to lead and just connecting with their employees as they are, instead of being like, hey, no, I need you to be right here. And I'm not going to give you the equipment for you to get here. I'm just going to tell you what I need. And I'm not going, I'm not going to accommodate you because you see people put accommodation letters and request it. And I know I've seen it firsthand where people would just ignore those accommodations because in their head, those are just reading as suggestions. I don't know how accommodations (laughs) and um, suggestions interwine, but it does. Right. Right. Yeah. Maybe this would be helpful. (laughs) please consider the following. Um, Lakshmi, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Alexis, because I, I love all the points that you made. Um, and I, similarly, I think I have, I have two issues, I think, that I'm passionate about, um, which is, you know, hiring people with disabilities in the first place, and then providing accommodations for them once they're hired, right? And I think those two things kind of go hand in hand. Um, I think there's a concern um, kind of Alexis to what you were saying about if people with disabilities are you know, capable of doing the job that they're applying to. Um, I think the unfortunate thing here that happens is that there are a lot of internal biases that come into play in the interview process and a lot of assumptions that get made because there could be that lack of education that these hiring managers or employers have about what these candidates can you know, bring to the table. Um, and I think what needs to change here is that interview process, just better interview training and bias awareness. Um, there's a great concept known as objective interviewing. And what that means is that you have to leave aside any at all assumptions made about the candidate and you focus solely on their qualifications um, and the core competencies or requirements of the position and how the candidates align with those. Um, and interview training in the sense is really vital because what it does is it holds every candidate to basically a similar standard and it gives everyone a fair chance at the job. Um, which is more of like a meritocratic approach, right? Um, And then the other issue, like I mentioned, was um, how to provide accommodations or even like what to provide once you hire the candidate with a disability. Or even before then, I think the assumptions come into play during the interview process where if the candidate discloses that they have a disability, employers may assume that providing accommodations would cause undue hardship to them. And so they don't hire the candidate. Um, And in my experience, I think there are, opportunities to provide, you know, more simple accommodations. Um, And it could be as simple as providing a step stool, providing captions and an ASL interpreter, providing visual descriptions. And I I think these should be the bare minimum. There's always more that can be done. But these are simple solutions that kind of show to the company how they can get the ball rolling and how the majority of the time hiring people with disabilities, it's not going to result in that undue hardship. And to Alexis's point about the virtual environment, She's absolutely correct. You know, in the past couple of years, I think the virtual environment has really lent itself to kind of removing a lot of those biases um, in the hiring process where, you know, it's not ultimately obvious. I, you know, I'm a little person and you can't really tell that I'm a little person. You see me from the shoulders up and it's not ultimately noticeable unless we, you know, talk in person, then you obviously will notice. Um, and so I think it, it does remove a lot of those biases. And I think when it comes to providing physical accommodations, if you allow your employees to work remotely, it removes that need as well. Um, And so there are a lot of benefits to having a virtual environment. And what really needs to change is just that interview process and providing those accommodations. And there are a lot of solutions um, that you can have towards making this process a lot easier and more inclusive. There are, and that's a great point. Um, You know, it's something that actually, there are a lot of simple solutions that can be put into place. and, And I think a lot of, employers are exactly that. They're intimidated by the idea of accommodations and they're thinking it's going to be um, much more complicated and expensive than it really turns out to be. Um, I'm gonna ask you just one quick yes or no unscripted question. And then Emma uh, mentioned that she would like to answer that question as well. But I do wanna know, have all of you, do you feel like you've all experienced some sort of bias or, um, you know, because of your disability, have you all, I'm seeing some nodding. So pretty much all of you feel like your disability has had impact 
on you personally. So yikes. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Um, so Emma, I think you wanted to also answer that question. Yes. Thank you, Carlene. Um, so going back to Alexis's point about like managers and leadership kind of understanding the whole realm of disability and Dakshi's point about, you know, the interview process, the accommodations before they enter the company and everything. I think that's super important. And that's one way to just kind of open the doors a little bit more. Um, but another issue is definitely the awareness level of managerial staff kind of outside of HR. So those mid-level and frontline managers that you interact with on a daily basis. Um, I feel like educating them on inclusive language, accommodations, and definitely the policies that are in place for their employees, because, um, you know, some employees may feel comfortable going to them for advice on, you know, how to go about a situation or a need that they have. And they'll really have the greatest impact on employees because they are interacting with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, there have been a lot of improvement, improvements and a lot of like kind of advertising, like DIA focused initiatives of in companies. Like you just, you read about it everywhere now, um, but sometimes we still feel like outsiders. So educating those managers um, is a way that they can really use that in their strategic planning and help us all feel like we're kind of striving for the same goal and we're all on the same level. That's great. Um, anybody else want to pitch in or um, we can move on to the next question? And um, Emma, I think that um, <clears throat> that kind of segues well to my next question for you, which is, do you feel that uh, dis diversity and inclusion programs often forget that disability is diversity? I um, can... Go ahead. Yeah, sorry to cut you off there. Oh, you're um, fine. I... I, I definitely um, do feel that. I, I do think the tide is changing, which is positive. Um, but yeah, for several years, um, disability, I think, has been left out of diversity and inclusion conversations. Um, and I, I think, unfortunately, and, and to what um, some of the other panelists are speaking to is just um, disability having this particularly strong stigma. Um, and, you know, we see that throughout history as well, which I think is interesting, though, is that um, when you look at the history of civil rights movements and things, disability often does um, end up coming last for various reasons. And so I think it makes sense um, that we continue to see that in conversations today. That said, at the same time, I think sometimes we look at diversity in silos, right? We look at um, you know, disability separate from other, other marginalized identities. Um, and so I think it's important to remember all of the experiences and so when we're talking about including disability in, in diversity conversations, it's not about saying the conversations that happened previously are, um, you know, somehow bad or, or unimportant, but rather um, just wrapping it into the natural fold of people are all different. Um, and that's definitely something in, in my work at the end of the day, something I always say is just, just people need to be more thoughtful, remember disability, be thoughtful about disability. Um, and yeah, so same thing here, L wrapping it into these conversations while acknowledging it's a different identity with different needs, unlike a lot of other identities, it's not just, you don't just have to want to have a disabled person in your workforce, you need to be accessible. Um, and so that's like another layer. Um, but yeah, unfortunately I do think it's been missing, but also I think now is the time we see so many companies with different goals. Unilever is one of them, their goal is 5% of a uh, uh, workforce with disabilities by 2025. Um, and even with the awesome work of disability in, um, I think the tide is turning where disability is becoming really well known and really wrapped up, um, but still, of course, work to work to go. Gotcha. Um, I didn't catch the order of the hands raising, so I'm just going to go from left to right. Um, but it looks like we have more folks who want to comment on that. Alexis, go ahead. Disability is really left out inside inside everyone's a lot of businesses mission statement for diversity and inclusion. I know one of the companies that I'm, I'm currently working with, um, one of their values says, our doors are always open. And when they define it, it says, our doors are always open to uh, for sex, religion, and your race. It, didn't, it doesn't say anything about disability, which is kind of weird because I do know a lot of companies do get paid for whenever they, they hire someone that has a disability, they get paid extra. So you would think in turn that they would help that person grow with the company. Be, 
it's just really weird. But a lot of people just forget and they just they're just thinking inside a bigger frame. Like, oh, no, if we just touch this market, everyone will eventually be happy. But even if they touch a race market, you can also see that they're only being including including people for race just to hire them and just to look good but at the end of the at the end of the day behind closed doors that company is not truly inclusive they're just seeing it so that's also another fear whenever companies do say hey i'm very inclusive with disability as well what's going to actually happen once i join that company can you show me anything that shows that you're actually down for someone that has a disability or are you just down for the benefits and the perks of insane that you have me on, on your team? Right. Right. Yeah. It seemed like, um, once, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion became important, everybody suddenly, you know, had, had a DEI person or organization or some, some initiative, you know, so, um, uh, Anna Marie, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I, I'm going left to right and I missed Emma. Emma, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Anna. Oh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think that disability is often kind of looked past. And I think one of the reasons is visibility. Sometimes it's not always a physical disability that you can see. Um, so when you know programs are, you know, setting their you know goals for the year, they'll say, oh, they'll they'll focus on the ones that they can see and that they can easily measure, which is sometimes not disabilities. And it makes it difficult, again, for them to focus on these areas. Um, and I believe that they really make us special in that they kind of, they um, they help our what we can do and our abilities because, you know, through living life with a disability, we've gained flexibility, we've learned to take initiatives, and I think it would really benefit them to, um, to focus on this and kind of find ways around, you know, the, the part where it's, you know, not always visible and kind of find ways to, to measure this, even if everyone is not self-identifying, which is also a right, um, mm-hmm. but it's definitely important. Gotcha. Um, Anna, go ahead. Oh, thanks. Um, so I guess I'll start by um, saying I loved um, Emmeline's, um like, comment about, like, the silos and like how we've been having positive developments, but we need to consider like the intersectionality here. I I do think that we are um, making good strides, you know, but yeah, unfortunately in um, like past years, um, obviously I haven't seen every company in the world since I'm 22. And, but um, I, in my experience, I have noticed that um, disability tends to be left out of the conversation. And while I have seen like resource groups and certain things for like maybe if you need an accommodation, there's um just usually not as much like visibility or events or any kind of conversation happening. Mm-hmm. It's just for that. Um, and I'll I'll add to that. Um, I I hope to see positive strides on that in the future, particularly in the industry I'm in because um I mentioned that I work as a laboratory technician. I, I have a lot of interest in the healthcare and um life sciences industry. And as Alexis mentioned, I mean disabled people are the largest um untapped uh, group of workers we got, you know? And um I, I think the you know life sciences, the healthcare would have huge benefits from involving and in hiring people with disabilities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lakshmi, you have thoughts on this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to echo some people's points, because a lot of great points have already been made, but, you know, disability doesn't discriminate, right? Anyone can get a disability later on in life. You don't just have to be born with it. And I think the stat is one in four people have some type of disability, right? Whether it's physical or neurological or cognitive. And that means that there's a huge, like everyone was saying, a huge untapped market for these employees. And that also means, um, just speaking from like a marketing background, a large part of a company's target customer base can have a disability. And I remember there was a um, a Nielsen study that showed that people with disabilities make up a $1 billion market and that 92% of Americans view companies that hire people with disabilities favorably. And there was also a, a study that Google conducted that showed that when it comes to advertising, 
customers are more likely to purchase from companies that show people like them in the marketing and behind the scenes. So not only is hiring people with disabilities to be behind the scenes the right thing to do, but it makes good business sense as well. And that kind of goes to Emily's point. Um, and so I think, you know, absolutely, it's an untapped market. It tends to be forgotten. And to Emma's point, that was really well, wonderfully said, you know, people with disabilities, not all of them have a visible disability. So it's not always recognizable. So maybe some companies don't know how to consciously hire for this demographic. Um, and I think a solution here would be to look at those disability centric organizations who have programs focused on connecting people with disabilities to companies um, and just making more of that conscious effort to get this demographic behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what are you seeing now as kind of the most important trends um, in you know, the world of business with regard to you know, trying to have these um, access and inclusion type initiatives? And then do you see generational differences? Do you see you know, companies that might be a, a, have a, a younger and workforce, do you see differences between companies somewhat based on generation? Um, I, I'd be happy to speak to this one as well. Um, Carleen, you, you mentioned it yourself with the, the term ADA generation, of, right. of, of course, referring to people um, who were born after the ADA um, and grew up in a world where at least they had legal rights um, for a, a lot of things like the right to education and the right to work. Um, which, of course, gives a, a completely different perspective um, when the law says you have a right to live a full life. Um, I definitely see it. Um, I, I think I see it maybe perhaps partially within um, the organization, but more so um, in my disability advocacy work outside um, of, of the company where absolutely um, people who are a little bit older tend to be much less comfortable with disclosure. Uh, is something I've noticed, um, which in the company world, when a company wants to um, show how diverse their workforce is, disclosure is everything. And disclosure is a big part of companies saying, first off, we need to convince people that it's okay to say I have a disability. Um, and so that's, I think, a real challenge because people who work, especially full time, tend to be a little bit older. Um, and so that's, I think, been a, a real challenge for organizations, which is we do have disabled employees. They don't want to self-ID. Um, for, for many, many different reasons. Part of it's going to be born after the ADA, but also culturally, um, oh my goodness, the, the perspective on disability has shifted so enormously. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate to be, you know, young and I have shirts that talk about how happy I am to be disabled and I go to disability pride parades. Um, but a lot of people that I know feel much less comfortable um, and, you know, conversations with friends, family, uh, growing up in a society that says you are lucky to be alive. Um, so yeah, in, in short, absolutely. I think generations make a difference. And I think as we navigate advocacy moving forward, how we talk about disability, I, I know I, I think a lot about it because on the one hand, I want to um, present this image of disability that is joyful and has the joy um, and is a, you know, a wonderful community, but also balancing that with the reality that a lot of people do have really negative feelings about their disability. So I, I think that's a really interesting challenge um, for us as advocates and young advocates is how do we make sure that we don't completely pretend like their experiences don't exist? And how do we validate those experiences um, while at the same time moving forward, how we talk and think about disability? Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting question that, that you asked, Carlene. Yeah, you know, in, in my work, sometimes what I encounter are um, folks of a certain generation for whom um, it's, um, I just, I just have a little heart trouble. I don't have a disability, you know, I just have, um, oh, well, you know, I've, I've just got some knee trouble. I've just got you know, whatever it is. And um, I think that they were, you know, part of a generation where a lot of people who really had um, significant disabilities were pushed out of the community. Um, and so I, you know, I think um, what I've observed at least, and I don't know, you know, if, if you've all seen this is sort of a different understanding of what the term disability even means. Have, definitely. I, uh, I've definitely seen how people define disability as so so wildly different, so wildly varied. Um, yeah. The one thing as, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking too, is the reality of as the world becomes more accessible, um, that's going to effectively change the skills people have. Like someone like me who I had the right to an education, 
Um, I also wonder how much that has changed the makeup of our community that now everybody is going to have a quality education. And um, now that things are have to be more physically accessible, digital accessibility, um, I definitely feel that in the blindness community, because of the explosion of technology, it's enabled blind people to enter a lot of industries that they never could have before. Even me being in marketing as a blind person is a little bit wild. Um, and I, I think that plays a big part of it too, is literally the physical landscape of, of our world changing has probably changed a lot about who interacts, who can be where and, and how people talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alexis, go ahead. There you go. I'm so sorry. No worries. Um, so to go back to your other point with the different generations, uh, my birth, like my mom, she's hard of hearing and she's been like that the majority of her life, I believe ever since she was four or five. Mm -hmm. And so she, it was kind of sh um, shunned. I believe that is the proper word for that of her having to advocate saying, Hey, I cannot hear you. And so she's very, very quiet, very, very meek. And then I do believe around the time I was about to graduate about 2019 from college, um, I started telling her more about the disability services at, at her then college before she graduated. She did not know she can get someone to write her notes for her. She was unaware that she can get extended time time for tests. Mind you, right. her kids had IEPs and I had that. She did not know those things could apply to her. So the access to that knowledge was very, very limited. I believe she was born around the time that the ADA um, really took off. Um, 1963, 1965. Wait, hold on. I'm not supposed to tell my mom's um, age. <laughs> uh, so I do, I do know like she's, she didn't know that. And then also running into different people in, inside my companies that I've worked with or even interacted with. Accommodations never seem, seem like anything that they can actually reach. Mm -hmm. And even with other, like I had a couple branch managers, like they'll have my fidget toys around and it's just for me to like have like just to be calm, but I've noticed the more people that have them, that they're better to the work environment's better, but they still don't ask for accommodations. And my generation, I do believe we're really big on, hey, are you going to help us get what we want or do we need to help ourselves? Mm -hmm. Like it's no if, ends and buts. I'm not going to wait for it. We're, we are a generation of now. I'm very impatient, uh, but <laughs> I want to make sure everything that I need is provided to me. And especially if I'm communicating my need and my wants in order to be successful, I'm going to, I need it. And I do feel, I feel really bad for the older, sorry, the older generation that actually didn't get to have that experience of ad advocacy mm -hmm. to actually help them out and said they had to just kind of take what they have. And I don't like that. And that was probably another reason why I pushed so hard to advocate for others like me or similar or fighting the same things that I fight. Sure, sure. Um, so we've got about 10 more minutes, I think, for questions. And then I'm going to go ahead and open it to uh, anybody out there. Um, you, Anyone who is interested in asking a question, just go ahead and put your question in the Q&A panel. Um, but I'm going to move on to the next one. So, and this is, these are great answers, by the way, this is, this is excellent information. And um, so um, business magazines like Forbes and Entrepreneur, their prediction has been that small business is the wave of the future for people with disabilities because it opens more doors to opportunity. Do you think that this is the case? Do you think that this is actually limiting or that it's, it's, you know, broadening opportunities for people with disabilities. So I see wheels turning. <laughs> I, I think this question is so interesting. Um, so actually disabled people have a higher rate of entrepreneurship um, mm -hmm. than non-disabled people. Um, the reason that I've seen cited is just that people, um, because of all the discrimination we're talking about, it's just easier to start your own business. You don't have to wait for somebody to give you permission um, mm -hmm. to do what you already know that you can do. Um, so now extending that to small business, I think entrepreneurship and working in small business are two different things. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm very curious. So my, my experience has been this, has been that big companies really love the flash of disability inclusion nowadays. Um, and they love, you know, talking about 
uh, certain percentages of the workforce um, being being disabled and different initiatives. And so I definitely feel like, you know, whether or not that translates to actual recruitment can be a challenge, but at least on the surface, these companies are making big moves. Mm -hmm. When I look at smaller companies, my experience has been that maybe they're a little bit slower um, to take that on. They have less of that like PR sense going around, especially when we're talking about maybe co companies that are working with other businesses, right? Not consumer facing. Mm -hmm. um, I know that in my recruitment process, I've had really positive experiences with big companies. Um, and when I was uh, recruiting for smaller organizations, that's where people like freaked out. Like I, I remember on the phone, um, somebody did not know that I was blind. I hadn't disclosed that yet. And it's an interview. And she looks at her resume over the phone and she says, oh, I see you have a lot of um, work with different blindness organizations. And she said, why do you do that? And I said, I'm blind. And the pause on the phone, <laughs> I have like 10 years um, and I will never forget that. And so I know that that my personal experience has just been, it, it, it's a little bit less, it, it's a little bit less. And in, in, in Unilever's big company and all these things, um, definitely like everybody's aligned to prioritizing me being able to have an experience as opposed to a company where maybe it's out of nowhere, out of the blue. Um, so, you know, that said, I, th I think also small businesses Sometimes you get a little bit worried about the cost of accommodation, um, but you're probably familiar with the, the Job Accommodation Network says that 60% of accommodations cost no money. The majority of the rest only cost up to $600. Accommodations are very cheap, um, but obviously a big company, that's going to be like the hiring manager wouldn't necessarily care, right? Like it's a billion dollar company will handle it. Maybe a smaller company, that's one of the biggest fears is cost of accommodation. So yeah, the, the, yeah. that's my, my, my perspective anyway. Sure. Um, Lakshmi, what's your thinking? Yeah, I interpreted the question as um, starting one's own business as like being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in like, in that sense, you know, starting one's own business, I kind of what Emily was saying, it's like, it, I think that's an opportunity for a lot of people with disabilities, um, because there are a lot of barriers to employment and getting hired by big businesses and even by small businesses. And um, I think one of, you know, a potential limitation was is being able to acquire those resources in order to start one's company in order to, um, you know, make a successful living at it. And I think one of the great things nowadays is that there are disability centric organizations that are focused on helping provide these resources for these entrepreneurs. So, um, you know, kind of encompassing what everyone else was saying, like, we're lucky to live in a time where these resources are available and people with disabilities have more employment opportunities than just, you know, working for a big business that they might not really be interested in or have a place in or feel included in, um, that they have different career pathways out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my next question is, um, where do you see the barriers remaining? And I think, um, I think you all addressed this a little bit earlier on, um, you know, where do you see barriers and then your ideas for removing those barriers? And I think I'm going to open it a little bit more and say, you know, what is your ideal look like? What's, what's your ideal workplace look like? Um, Anna, go ahead. Meeting. There we go. Um, so I think my ideal workplace, like years and years down the line, right? Or hopefully sooner, but <laughs> oh, yeah. Not too many. scratch that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> like, I think one of the, um, I guess, things I, I've personally noticed with a lot of, um, like, disability, um, I guess, work for inclusion, at least in companies, has kind of been, like, fixing pre-existing systems to include people with disabilities mm -hmm. and um this is I guess a general thought but in the future I think one of the biggest things I would like to see is like when we create systems we should be actively thinking about disabled people in the first place we should have them involved in the creation we should have them involved in like the system or the product um I think that would be my my ideal like yeah yeah um do you all feel hopeful that change is happening and will continue to happen that's i see a lot of nodding so that's great um yeah so uh emma go ahead um i see a lot of barriers remaining with the implementation and effectiveness of diversity and inclusion programs as I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of DEIA initiatives and a lot of companies just kind of like it's 
for lack of better words, like advertising um, what they have to offer. Mm -hmm. And they, um, but I think the issue with this is, is we don't really know how the implementation is going. Like are employees adopting this? Are they accepting the fact that, you know, they can, they are they taking advantage of these opportunities and how well are they working? And so it's really hard for people who are outside the company to find this out, like before the interview process or before they accept that job offer. Um, and so I think one way to remove this barrier is to just speak with somebody at the company and see if they know anything about it. Um, an even better way would be to have like in the future, possibly like advocates out of the company who have taken advantage of these opportunities available to them and who can speak on behalf of themselves and personal experience and just share that with you so that you can really get a full picture before entering the company. Because if you enter a company and it's not what you think it is, you're kind of, you're not stuck, but it's a very hard place to navigate alone and not being able to get what you need in order to do your job that can, um, it doesn't foster success. And so I think that's a big issue. And down the line, I hope to see widespread access to technology, just having it affordable to companies of all sizes so that, you know, we have the ability to work in, you know, large corporations, like Emmeline said, like Unilever, who has all of these programs, and then also small businesses who also need our expertise. Um, so that's what I hope to see. Awesome. Um, Alexis, go ahead. I think one way to remove the barriers that we have, um, so we all know that companies get paid for having people with, the, with disabilities, but is it actually another company that can actually monitor the monitor the company and see how, how successful the person that, I guess not, I don't want to say funding, I don't want to say it correctly, but basically funding them with that company, like how, how their actual success is moving, because why am I giving money? And why am I paying you extra to have someone on your team? And they're just at one stagnant, stagnant position. And are you guys actually feeding in to that person? And then even with them, I really just think that should be something that we should have because that way people can actually be advocated for. And then the company will be held accountable for, hey, you're wasting my money because this person isn't isn't doing anything and they don't have any morale or anything left left to give you guys. So what happened? But I honestly, I think my true barrier that also needs to go is just the front end managers and their biases and actually believing because it's really weird that it's harder to get a mentor or a supporter, if that makes sense, like inside the company sometimes if that company's is really, really away from disability. Mm -hmm. So the majority of my mentors and supporters are people that came from disability in or, or who has a disability itself, their self. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Lakshmi, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I consider myself cautiously optimistic, I think for the hope of business. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of changes happening. I think it's moving very slowly and that's what happens in big business. It's about, you know, wrapping your mind around the idea of being more inclusive and what it means to be inclusive and how accessibility means something different to everybody. So there's a lot more for people to learn and a lot, um, a lot of room for improvement, I think, in this area. Um, but Anna had said something great about how, you know, her ideal business is taking into consideration people with disabilities first when designing these environments. Um, there's a great TED talk by a woman named Elise Roy. She's a disability advocate. Um, she's a deaf woman. And she had basically said that when we design for people with disabilities first, we design for everybody. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that when it comes to products, services, environments, if we design for people with disabilities first, it doesn't prevent able-bodied people or people without disabilities from using these environments and these resources. It just makes it easier for everybody. Um, and so that's definitely what I think is an area of improvement and what I hope a lot of companies do. Um, and I think that what we're seeing, especially in the past couple of years with people working remotely, is that these offices are not being used. So it's a it was a great opportunity. I'm hoping companies have taken advantage of it to maybe restructure their environments and look more into how they can make it more accessible for when people eventually come back to the workplace. Um, and that's then true. I also want to have got time, right? <laughs> No, exactly. Yeah. I, I think we're starting to see people like move back into the workplace, yeah, and move yeah. it back into the offices, but hopefully there's a, a bit of a, um, a pause there for them to actually do this if they haven't yet. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to say that, you know, a good way of kind of determining a company's culture and 
I guess, their inclusivity is looking at if they have something called an employee resource group or an affinity group. And what this is, is basically a sub group within the greater company. These are typically for larger companies um, that are focused on providing a really supportive and safe environment for people of certain demographics. So I know that my company has an affinity group group for people with disabilities, um, and it's just a great way to be able to meet people who are who have had faced similar difficulties than you in the workforce, and you can offer that support and um, help you just learn a little bit more about how you can navigate these different environments. Um, so that's my hope for the future that there are more affinity groups, and you know that we make these ex- we make we focus on accessibility at the forefront. Of making yeah, the yeah. Um, I I had somebody mention sort of to to piggyback off that, uh, piggyback off of that, um, somebody said, maybe all corporate boards should be required to have a disability advocate on the board to ensure that company makes sure it's a priority. What do you think? I see heads nodding. So definitely something for you all to promote. Um, I have so many more questions I could ask you all. Um, this has been fabulous, but I really want to turn it over to, um, People who've been listening, if you have any questions for our um, for our panelists before I move on to the last question, <laughs> um, I did have one here. Do you ever feel like employees think you should be happy to even have a job, and are therefore maybe less likely to promote you or pay you equitably as compared to your peers? I see nodding heads. <laughs> uh oh. So, um, di- differing experiences maybe on this one. Does anybody want to tackle that? Oh, shoot. So, um, I- I'm sure those people are um, out there. And I-, I-, I think it might honestly slightly depend on like who you are and what disability you have. You know, that might change what bias is being used against you there. I'll yeah. see in my experience, like as an autistic woman, I mean, I, I've had some work experiences that have been absolutely fantastic, would not treat them or a single coworker for the world. But, you know, I've also had like a, a, a couple of that so great. <laughs> and, um, I'll say in my experience that um, ableism towards me has typically been um, infantilization, you know, kind of the yeah. idea like, oh, like, she's like autistic like oh we can't have her do this she's not capable of doing that she's dumb and um I knew it was that for one of the jobs because they treated me um you know very very respectfully until I revealed that I had autism and like her face was like wow. oh I, I never would have yeah so I think that would be um I I, I guess my experience in that I, I think it um, I guess kind of depends on each person's personal experience. Gotcha. Um, I have someone who says, I work primarily with people who have hidden problems returning to work, um, specifically those with a mental health diagnosis. So what, um, what are some tips you could provide to use when advocating, um, you know, for yourself or presenting yourself as an asset to business, despite needing supports, maybe supported employment, something like that, a job coach. So um, what's, what do you think? What would you recommend to somebody who, who um, needs to advocate in that way? I can speak to this. Um, I think there's a lot of different conversations to be had when you're entering the workplace. Um, one, of course, is do you want to disclose? Um, you, you don't always have to, right? And you can make that decision for yourself. Whatever whatever your you know values are on that topic, then mm-hmm. you can go with that. That said, um, you know, if you are going to need accommodations, I'm right there with you. I, I think it's a really, really common concern for people who do have accommodations who are going to cost money. So maybe for me, it's like software or special screen reader. Um, and I would just remember, like, that is just part of the reality is that you do need an accommodation. 
Um, and at the same time, you're going to provide a lot of value to an organization. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of organizations realize now more and more that even if you're not some kind of super genius, just the fact that you have a disability means that you think differently. It means that you're going to raise concerns over things. So if it's like, say you're you know part of customer service department, um, you're the kind of person who can actually bring up a topic. Hey, you know we don't have um, a service, so people who, who call in who are deaf, like they can't talk to us. Um, those kinds of things. So remember that there's a lot of inherent value in just being an employee, employee with a disability. And mm -hmm. so that's valid to have the accommodation. I'd also remind, you know, remind, remind yourself that you have the legal right to that accommodation. Um, and so it's kind of like if a company is going to be, um, if you want to feel uncomfortable about it, the reality is you have those rights. It's the company's responsibility to provide that to you. Um, and you have that disability. And that does not mean that you don't get to live your life, even if it's a small inconvenience. And that's at the end of the day, what all these things are. A job coach, um, a couple hundred dollars for an accommodation. For a company that's running with more than um, a couple dozen employees, that's that's just not a lot of money. That's a very typical thing. Mm -hmm. um, 99% of accommodations that are requested are things that probably employees higher up in the company already have. And just remember, every single employee has accommodations, right? You go to the office, there are chairs, there are desks, people have, you know, their health care um, paid for by the company, all these different things. You just have a slightly different set of, of accommodations. Um, so yeah, I think it's about building that confidence, realizing you deserve those accommodations, realizing that the law has your back on those accommodations. Um, and then hopefully finding companies that are not going to make your life difficult because of that. I think most of them will not, especially if, as, if you're clear um, about what you need. Um, but yeah, so that's some of my thoughts. That, that is fantastic. I wish we had more time, um, but I think we're going to have to wrap stuff up. And, and like, you know, Lakshmi mentioned, it's that universal design concept, right? If you're thinking of it from the get-go and you're thinking in universal terms, um, you know, that that's, everybody needs something and, you know, thinking ahead and having it as part of the planning is, is part of the key to it. And that universal design can benefit everybody. So, and I, I want to thank you all again, so much, so much for being here. Um, and, um, yeah, this was great information and I want to thank you again for joining us and thank my panelists. And, um, you know, I hope to see you folks in the news or other efforts in the future. And um, thank you again for everybody out there. Um, we are the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. If you do have questions on the Americans with Disabilities Act, you can call us toll free at 1-800-949-4232. If you live within one of the Mid-Atlantic states, you can also reach us at 301-217-0124. You can email us at adainfo at transcend.org um, or you can get information at adainfo.org. And thanks again to everybody and have a great afternoon.